Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, Chapter Thirty Three. In her furred travelling dress, Estella seemed more delicately beautiful than she had ever seemed yet, even in my eyes. Her manner was more winning than she had cared to let it be to me before, and I thought I saw Miss Havisham's influence in the change. We stood in the inn yard while she pointed out her luggage to me, and when it was all collected, I remembered. Having forgotten everything but herself in the meanwhile, that I knew nothing of her destination, I am going to Richmond," she told me. "Our lesson is that there are two Richmonds, one in Surrey and one in Yorkshire, and that mine is the Surrey Richmond. The distance is ten miles. I am to have a carriage, and you are to take me. This is my purse, and you are to pay my charges out of it. Oh." You must take the purse. We have no choice, you and I, but to obey our instructions. We are not free to follow our own devices, you and I. As she looked at me and giving me the purse, I hoped there was an inner meaning in her words. She said them slightingly, but not with displeasure. A carriage will have to be sent for, Estella. Will you rest here a little? Yes, I am to rest here a little. And I am to drink some tea, and you are to take care of me the while. She drew her arm through mine as if it must be done, and I requested a waiter who had been staring at the coach like a man who had never seen such a thing in his life to show us a private sitting room. Upon that, he pulled out a napkin as if it were a magic clue without which he couldn't find the way upstairs, and led us to the black hole of the establishment, fitted up with a diminishing mirror. Quite a superfluous article, considering the whole's proportions, an anchovy sauce cruet, and somebody's patents. On my objecting to this retreat, he took us into another room with a dinner table for thirty, and in the grate a scorched leaf of a copy book under a bushel of coal dust. Having looked at this extinct conflagration and shaken his head, he took my order, which, proving to be merely some tea for the lady. Sent him out of the room in a very low state of mind. I was, and I am, sensible that the air of this chamber, in its strong combination of stable with soup stock, might have led one to infer that the coaching department was not doing well, and that the enterprising proprietor was boiling down the horses for the refreshment department. Yet the room was all in all to me, Estella being in it. I thought that with her I could have been happy there for life. I was not at all happy there at the time. Observe, and I knew it well. Where are you going to at Richmond? I asked Estella. I am going to live, said she, at a great expense with a lady there, who has the power, or says she has, of taking me about and introducing me. And showing people to me, and showing me to people. I suppose you will be glad of variety and admiration. Yes, I suppose so. She answered so carelessly that I said, "You speak of yourself as if you were someone else." Where did you learn how I speak of others? Come, come," said Estella, smiling delightfully. "You must not expect me to go to school with you." I must talk in my own way. How do you thrive with Mister Pocket? I live quite pleasantly there, at least. It appeared to me that I was losing a chance. At least, repeated Estella. As pleasantly as I could anywhere away from you. You silly boy," said Estella quite composedly. "How can you talk such nonsense?" Your friend, Mister Matthew, I believe, is superior to the rest of his family. Very superior indeed. He is nobody's enemy. Don't add but his own," interposed Estella, "for I hate that class of man. But he really is disinterested and above small jealousy and spite. I have heard. I am sure I have every reason to say so. You have not every reason to say so of the rest of his people," said Estella, nodding at me with an expression of face that was at once grave and rallying. 
for they beset Miss Havisham with reports and insinuations to your disadvantage. They watch you, misrepresent you, write letters about you, anonymous sometimes, and you are the torment and the occupation of their lives. You can scarcely realize to yourself the hatred those people feel for you. They do me no harm, I hope. Instead of answering, Estella burst out laughing. This was very singular to me, and I looked at her in considerable perplexity. When she left off, and she she had not laughed languidly, but with real enjoyment. I said, in my diffident way with her, I hope I may suppose that you would not be amused if they did me any harm. No, you may be sure of that, said Estella. You may be certain that I laugh because they fail. Oh, those people with Miss Havisham, and the tortures they undergo! She laughed again and even now, when she had told me why, her laughter was very singular to me, for I could not doubt its being genuine, and yet it seemed too much for the occasion. I thought there must really be something more here than I knew. She saw the thought in my mind and answered it. 